Uh, uh, th thanks, Ty, but that was right to the second, you know, on the dot, that was fantastic. Uh, a question for you and uh, for, 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 for Joseph. And I'm just going to say quickly that we are not going to go onto the floor because I think we're running out of time and it would be really good to sort of uh, uh, get, get a quick round going. Um, so the, the last quotation you showed there I think is really great, the one about engagement with uh, a different kind of imaginary. I think that's a very important uh, question. I, I, I would love to hear from you if there are any examples of those engagements uh, from the Lagos, from, from, from the, if not from the Lagos, at least from the Nigerian, um, you know, um, the housing sector. And uh, Joseph, I think uh, the images you showed of some of the work you have done are actually really interesting um, examples of that sort of like very grounded imaginary. So I think it's uh, there's a very interesting overlap between what you're talking about, but I just wanted to kind of uh, put that on the table and uh, just try to get a, um, yeah. Okay, um, a lot of Lagos has been governed by residents associations amongst the middle income and then with the local, com the local communities um, associations among the low income. And so the power of cooperatives is very strong. Um, residents associations are the ones that are actually providing the infrastructure in many of the communities. And um, unfortunately, they are just being ignored. They are, not being, they are not seen as an important stakeholder in the reshaping of the city. And until they are able to have a space at the table of planning, of governance, and of even providing the infrastructure of the city, there will continue to be gaps. Yeah, I, I think to build on what she said, uh, we also, uh, the Kenyan Federation of Slum Dwellers, we organize around women collectives, around cooperatives. And I think there is a realization that that is not enough. And I think, uh, as I said earlier, uh, issues of housing, issue of transforming cities is the responsibility of all. I think we realize uh, slum dwellers, uh, they have a right to housing, they have a right to services, but they also have a responsibility and responsibility is not to sit and wait for houses to fall from heaven. They have a responsibility. And that's why we have been acting with, uh, with this project we are doing in Mokuru. We have mobilized 42 organizations which are giving the city a service in skills. Mm -hmm. So when the, the city declared this, part of, part, part, part of it we were, we were addressing a land issue. Uh, as somebody said, the entire Nairobi is at the risk of Muslim dwellers are at a risk of uh, being evicted. All the 100%, almost all the land in informal settlements is inhabited by slum dwellers. And the other thing is also the plan we are developing for Mokuru. How does it fit in the mass plan? I think I have a right to say uh, stupid. Somebody set a president earlier. We had a very stupid... Uh, 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 master plan, which was basically saying, you plan for the city, but don't plan for the informal settlements. And the question was, how can you not plan? Somebody was saying 30% of people, residents of Nairobi is a city of 4 million, over 4 million people. It's not 30%. Almost 60% of the residents of, Slam, of Nairobi live in informal settlements. We usually say for every person in Nairobi, you have a relative in the informal settlement, whether you like it or not. So for us, how does this plan fit in the bigger master plan for Nairobi? The master plan at the moment at the city level is bring down old houses, put up new, more expensive, shinier houses. We think that we, as she said in Lagos, that is not a solution. The solution is to improve, is to upgrade the informal settlements. I think one of the um, interesting points at this stage of a conversation like this is that you, you could conclude that any form of planning is useless, depressing, and bad. Right? But I think we should also remind ourselves that you can do it well. And we have heard uh, one and have experienced other examples. And I was wondering, Jose, might you comment on that in the sense that could one take from this conversation anything that is positive? Well, I showed the, the, the Kennedy visiting two housing states in the, in the 1960s as a moment of optimism because I, in my mind it combines two issues. 
One is, let, let's call it that, at the end of the day, urban planning and the production of housing is a political act. And if we try to turn it into strictly a technocratic act of just supply and demand, we are, uh, will just be replicating mistakes. <coughs> so the question for me is whether we could connect the question, the, the housing delivery system to a planning protocol that combines the best about what's political, who do we cater, who pays for it, who finances it, who benefits, and who are the losers, with a more informed, research-based uh, grammar of success, but also grammar of failures. It's actually surprising that, in a way, this, the eight presentations today have talked about forms of research. The real transformation today at Infonavit is that there's now a research unit well-funded doing relevant work, bringing not only the architects to rethink the problem of social, of social housing, but actually connecting knowledge to action. And that's a way in which the technical can become political. Belinda, on this point of feedback loops. Um, I wanted to, to add, from what I'm hearing around the table, is that there are communities who could help themselves. You know, they have resources to mobilize, and this calls to mind something that I read uh, about the housing development in Lima, in Peru, where um, for the informal settlements, what they did was they gave uh, land titles to the informal settlers. And upon receiving the land titles, because that is security of tenure, and that actually accelerated housing investment by the community themselves, where they would then you know, use their savings to retrofit, to upgrade their own house to as much as 60% you know, of expenditure. So I think you know, there, there seems to be uh, pockets of different models, different housing models, different strokes for different situations. Because like in Thailand, they have CODI, Community Organization Development Initiative, which has you know, worked with the local communities. Because what the communities lack sometimes is the know-how, how to do, how to engage in conversation with uh, the policy makers, how to mobilize uh, resources that is within them themselves. So I think there is opportunity for better understanding what is possible within the communities. And this brings up the importance of research, R&D, the importance of understanding, finding out what is really needed by the communities, by the people who are going so to live in these If houses. we take what Belinda is saying, Gautam, Taibat, in your context, is there enough trust to actually take this language and apply it where you are, or not? Because I don't hear that. I, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I, think, I don't think there are <clears throat> any communities that are saying that they don't want engagement with the state or with planning. It is about the terms of engagement that they want with planning. And I think that you know, if we have an 18 million housing shortage, we also have 9 million vacant houses. Now, you put those two together. For me, what the state needs to be doing when it speaks of housing is to think about its role also as a regulator of real estate and land markets. What com there are many things communities cannot do and should not do at scale. And to me, there's two parts that are the focus. Large-scale trunk infrastructure, we should not be building underground drains in an auto-constructed matter. And two, the second is the opportunity to hold on to some forms of land in rapidly expanding cities. The state, unfortunately, currently in the Indian context, is focusing on micro-planning and building affordable housing for people who can build their own. But it is not doing the work communities needed to, which is protecting them, the time for them to get there, 
and actually talking about the most patient capital I know, which is speculative real estate, which will sit on peri-urban edges of cities for 25 years in buildings they will complete at 90% but not close, because it's not about that apartment. No one is ever meant to live in $700,000. They're holding on to the land. They're not actually building housing. So the question for planning for me is, let the state begin to regulate land and real estate, not only think about housing when it has to find beneficiaries instead of partners. Yes, I'm going further from there. The, the challenge we have in Lagos is that the planning framework doesn't recognize the informal communities. And if 95% of transactions occur outside of the state-sanctioned one, that the whole city is informal. The, the situation now is, well, land is very valuable because there's not a lot of it in Lagos, but we need to renegotiate how the city is being shaped, who are the stakeholders, and planning needs to step beyond technical. And planning also needs to learn from how people are producing the houses. In fact, planning, especially in the context of Lagos, needs to step away from the British, you know, the colonial framework, which is what we have inherited and which we have not grown beyond. So I think we thank you very much for that comment. Uh, I think we should uh, begin to conclude. Uh, I just want to reflect on two concepts, two and a number of phrases that were brought up in the scene setting discussions this morning. Alcinda has been sitting here quietly but it's quite interesting how uh, we have not mentioned the word young people for about four hours. Mm. Right? It's just it's a reflection. I mean, you, you raise that point, uh, and perhaps there's an inadequacy in terms of uh, what the frameworks and, and, and the models of thinking do. Who's going to be living in these places is exactly uh, those generations. Where does the public realm come into that? And I, I was. Um, touched by that, and I think we need to reflect on it. Similarly, I guess uh, Edgar's uh, challenge to Park Stow and to others about how, how are we organizing, how are we setting up systems uh, where we can make cities which are more complex and more diverse, um, perhaps that conversation could be richer. Uh, and in terms of what we've been saying in the last hour and a half, I think there's a lot that, that needs to go back in there, and imagination is, is, is part of that process not to mention funding, subsidy, and taxation. All those are issues that we're going to at least touch upon tomorrow. This is where I just want to uh, wind up um, and uh, this session. But before uh, I give you some remarks for how we're going to do things tomorrow, can you please join me in thanking this great panel? Thank you very much. Uh, we haven't gone back to that, but maybe the broken heart can be fixed uh, is sort of a metaphor which I'm going away with. Uh, the, the plan for tomorrow, uh, there are just a few announcements I want to make, is that we're starting at 9.30, but with a slight change of program in relation to what you have on your yellow document. Uh, we are starting at 9.30 on the dot. Uh, Vera Songwe, the Executive Secretary of the ECA, the Economic Commission for Africa will be giving a keynote speech broadly on issues of the challenges of uh, financing uh, urban urbanization in Africa. She will be introduced by Susanna Moorhead, who is the British ambassador. And as I mentioned before, we will be bracketing that with the German ambassador with closing remarks with Anna Herrhausen. Um, a couple of very, very simple things to bear in mind. Please bring your lanyards for tomorrow. Otherwise, you have to re-register. So if you just have this, you can come uh, straight in. There are two parallel events uh, organized on Saturday. One is organized by the Goethe Institute and another by the Urban Center. Uh, more information is available for both of these events outside um, in terms of leaflets on the tables. So if you want to engage in that, please um, take up the information and talk to the relevant people who will make themselves known to you. Um, thank you very much for all of you. It's amazing to see the density and intensity of this room, which only reflects the density and intensity of the uh, issue of developing urban futures. We very much look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for coffee at 9, so we can start punctually at 9.30. Thank you all very much.